Hi, uh, this is Kate White. For those of you who know me, um, my name is Kate White. I'm working with working with babies and families, and this is a part of a live discussion with my friend Dr. Jonathan Evans, who's an Australian osteopath. So tonight we're talking about strabismus. Uh, so we have a really pretty interesting case that I brought up to Jonathan. Hopefully, he can help us reveal some of the mysteries behind working with babies that have strabismus. So. Go ahead, Jonathan, do you want to start in? Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Kate. Uh, yeah, no, very good case. Um, I've come across this a few times with cerebral. So just to clarify what that is, let's demystify that. It's just basically when you've got poor contrast, control of the muscles of the eye, and so the eyes don't coordinate particularly well. And with babies, you'll often tend to see the most common pattern is this eye drifting in. So you see that one eye or perhaps two will drift in immediately. Now, sometimes what you find is that comes and goes, and that can confuse parents. And I remember a case where the mum got very frustrated because every time she took the, the uh, baby to the pediatrician, the eyes were fine. And then as soon as she kind of came out of the car park, the eyes would go again. So we can talk about a little bit about why that comes and goes. Um, but it's a good, great thing, I think, to talk about. And also the other part of the case, so I don't know if you wanted to outline briefly the, the case case that I'm really interested in is that extension pattern that we see in the spine, because we see that more commonly than strabismus. strabismus. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I think that's good to talk about. Yeah, well, there are a lot of interesting things about working with this family. First of all, I just want to say the mother is really extremely attuned to the baby, and um, so there's a really great working relationship there, and that's one thing I teach when I, when I teach about working with babies is to work with the relationship too. And um, this baby was uh, was born in September, so now he's about six months old, and he has uh, he has strabismus, but he has more going on. He has a lot of tongue thrusting, so his tongue is out a lot. He's a mm. very very joyful baby, and um, mm. he loves uh, going going upside down. So we work a lot with inversion, and he mm. loves tummy time. So he's often in tummy time, and he pushes up a lot. Um, yeah. He was uh, 10 pounds, and he was had shoulder dystocia when he was born, and he <clears throat> had to be resuscitated. So there's mm -hmm. a lot going on uh, mm -hmm. in his system. Uh, so we have worked pretty steadily twice a week now for about five weeks, maybe four and a half. And he's um, we've worked a little bit inside the mouth, especially with the with the hard palate. Um, and his maxillae bones. Uh, so, I mean, I have a quite a long list of all the things we've done. So, yeah. but I'd like to hear more about what what your thoughts are, Jonathan. Yeah, well, I think let's tackle that strabismus first. So, mm -hmm. uh, just basically in terms of the anatomy, you've got the eyeball, and then you've got these muscles that that come back from various parts of the eye. We won't go into the various details of the different muscles, but they come back into a common tendon and that common tendon attaches to the phenoid bone at the back of the orbit. And so, first of all, you know, we can just immediately see then that any, any change in balance in terms of those muscles of the eye and the coordination can be influenced by that sphenoid bone. And obviously, as you're working cranially with this baby, we, we can influence that. But if we dig a little bit more technically than that, what we're going to do is dig in technically, and then we're going to zoom back out when our brains are starting to get fried yeah. up with all this yeah. technical information. So... The cranial nerves, so if we're looking at the influence on the eye, we're looking mainly here in terms of the actual eye muscles and then the innovation to those muscles. So it could be the nerves that control the muscles or the balance of the muscles themselves. Now, both of those can be influenced by what's going on with the cranial bones. And so the sphenoid, which is obviously a key bone, around the sphenoid, we have the cavernous sinus, which is this area you know, with a lot of venous blood in there, and that can get quite congested if the cranial bones and the, the dura are not work in the way we'd like them to work. And the cranial nerves, number of cranial nerves pass through that area, and in particular ones that influence it here in terms of cranial nerve uh, three, cranial nerve four, and cranial nerve six. But we don't need to dig into too much depth there. Now, also, if we dig back a little bit more, uh, if we look at, at one of those cranial nerves, the abduction, that also goes underneath a ligament called the sphenopetrous ligament, which is the slip of this dura between the sphenoid and the temporal bone. So we're digging you know, deeply into this technical aspects of that. 
And sometimes what can happen is as we start to work with baby, we're trying to put all these things in our head and we just annoy the hell out of baby because we've got so much stuff. Right. Going on. But that's why it's great to have a format like this where we take it offline. We're not with baby, but we dig into that anatomy and we understand a little bit more of what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to influence the drainage out of the head, which will help those nerves as they pass through the cavernous sinus so there's not congestion. And we're also trying to influence the dura and the position of the bones so that the cranial nerves also don't have any restrictions on them. So if we take that as our technical aspect and we work into that, and then when we put our hands on, we can have this, right, okay, well, I need to visualize the bones, the sphenoid, the temporal, the different parts of the temporal, the frontals, the ethmoid, all of this. But when we put our hands on, we're trying not to be intrusive because if we think about that, the baby gets wound up very easily. Yeah. yeah and this, and, and this baby... Go on. Yeah, this baby is really clear about yeah. what, he, what... If you start to get too close, he'll like uh, he, he'll push your hands away. He'll say no. Yes. But if yes. you... But if I keep my attention back and I have my hands on him and I wait, um, he, allow, he allows work to be done. And it's, uh, it was very fascinating today to work with his um, rib cage because he had that shoulder dystocia also. So... And he had mm. to be resuscitated. But one mm. of the things I wanted to ask you about before you go further is um, mm. we've been talking, I had another practitioner work with me about all the, all the bones in the front and the face, the, the nose, the vomer, the ethmoid, the palatine, the amexili, and the sphenoid, and how they're kind of like a shock absorber. Yeah. They're very, they're very flexible. And this baby was born posterior, so mm. there was a lot of pressure on the frontal bone down. Um, so we're, we're very curious about, uh, how to relieve that pressure. And that there have been times when the coronal sutures was, was very, very vi vivid. And we work a lot with lifting, lifting and, and, and feeling into what's possible into the front. But it, there, there was a big expansion when we first started. So, and the eyes totally changed, but there's still, there's still a lot of tension there. There's. And one thing I want to say to listeners is that doctors have been clear with the mother that it's a muscle problem and how they, how they want to fix it is by surgically um, removing the muscles and reattaching them. Yeah. So she's trying everything she can to avoid the surgery. Yeah. Well, it's an important point because, you know, we sometimes what can, what we have to be very careful to is to, have consent for what we do, but also the idea of informed consent is that we're informing the mother in this case of all the different possibilities. We're giving her our knowledge and it's her job then to advocate for her baby and decide what to do. So we must never say, don't do surgery. Oh That's no, yeah. And not that I suggest you were doing that, but it's just good to point that out. And so we almost walk in two paths with saying, okay, well, we're gonna do as much as we can do and if we get to a point where this is perfect and you don't need surgery, hooray. But if it is get to a point where you need surgery and that correction, well, mm -hmm. all the work we've done is going to help to make that surgery more effective. And also we can obviously work on the baby after the surgery mm -hmm. as well. So sometimes in these cases, you, you do need this, you know, for whatever reason, uh, you know, in terms of what's happened with the cranial bones, the dura, the torsion and, and the trauma through the birth, or what's happening in utero. So there's many, many different things that are going on. And it ties back into what you're saying. This baby tells you what to do. It's true. That's really important. So you put your hands on, and if you've got this agenda, so we might talk about, you know, the, the, we were talking about the maxilla, the speed reducers in terms of what's happening, and when, they, when you eat it, it, prevents that force coming up and smashing up into the, um, into the sphenoid and those bones. Mm. So, there's obviously something going on there. So there's a lot of things going on, but we, we put our hands on and we, tr and we wait and we see what happens. What I do is I, tr I go for ease. What position will get the baby happier? And as you do that, it's maybe just using your intention or even a tiny, tiny bit of movement, often just intention. You'll find that, oh, baby likes that. And so you might continue to go in that direction. And as you do that, if you're not listening enough, and that's not a judgment, it's just that some babies have less slack than others. And so if you aren't listening enough for that situation, then babies start to get upset. And you can pick those signs. There'll be a redding in the face, 
a slight twitch, or the tissues will resist. So what you're looking to do is do a small movement with intention or with your, with your hand to match what's there, and then you're waiting for baby to tell you the next movement, and you, I mean, you go on in that manner, in this kind of treasure hunt. Mm. But the reason we take it offline and do this kind of information here in this kind of webinar is that if you're aware of all those different things, if you go and look online and how those muscles attach to the eye and how they come back and they attach you know, the annulus of Zena onto the sphenoid, if you know the sphenoid attachments to the temporal, you know the dura, or all of those different things, then it enables you to have a much better understanding of the feeling and the feedback coming under your hand. And to give you a, a classic example to wrap this little segment up, you do this exercise in palpation. They sometimes use this in optometric college where they put a coin underneath a cloth or a tablecloth and you've got to palpate the coin and work out what it is. You know, so for example, the American, you have different currencies to us, but it may be a, in the UK a 50p piece or one pound or whatever. And you get better and better as your palpation increases. And then they do sneaky things like they'll sneak in a foreign coin. So they might put in a, a US, I don't know what you use, a dollar. Do you have a dollar coin? A, you know, a US coin. And there you are going, suddenly you're not quite sure what's going on and you're like trying to pick it. And is it a 50 cents, 50p piece or is it a pound coin? And then they pull it out and you go, ah, oh, you were cheating. How was I meant to know it was that? And so what we're doing now is expanding all our knowledge of the different coins in the different currencies. But if you aren't aware of what could be there technically in terms of anatomy, then you're going to come up against a, if you're in the US, you're going to come up against a British 50p piece and you're going to go, I have no idea what this is. For. So, that, so that's where we've got these two things, these technical aspects. And then when we put our hands on, we kind of clear that of our mind, clear, clear that of our mind, but it's going to be staying in our minds and hands forever if we've done this, what we're doing here in, in this. All right, got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, well, before we, 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 we click off for this part, could you talk about extension, Jonathan? And could you also talk about the tongue? Because mm. his tongue is, is extended a lot. It's a lot less than it was. Um, and he tended to, to, it, to pull to the left, so you know that there's some tension there on the left side. Yeah. But I would love to hear what you're thinking about extension and what you think about the tongue consistently being out. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's just define this for the for people watching. Extension, what we mean is this big arching of the spine, you know, so the mm -hmm. tummy pushes forward, the, the head arches back, and the and neck often will arch back as well. And to understand this, probably the best way to think about it is think about meningitis. So if somebody has meningitis, they talk about this stiff neck and they talk about this nuchal rigidity because what's happened is the meninges, which the dura is part of the meninges, have become inflamed. Now meningitis is just one cause of that. And so what's happening is the body is trying to go into this position to create ease. And so it drops into this extension pattern. You have this nuchal rigidity mm -hmm. and there's various signs there's like brubinsky's uh, bruzinski sign which they test for meningitis where if you lift and try and put the neck in deflection the body resists or the knees come up uh, to try and create slack and so this brings us into two points here one is that there's this connection from the neck to the head and what we'll talk about that is sometimes it's called the core link so the dura and the meninges that surround the brain travel all the way down the spinal cord and connect to that sacrum. And so this is a classic case in that Brzezinski, the Brzezinski sign, is that when you're trying to influence the neck, bringing into flexion, there's so little slack in the system because of meningitis and the inflammation and contraction of the meninges that it literally will bring your hips and knees into a flexed position. So there's this huge kind of, wow, look at that. Now we're not talking about meningitis, obviously, in this little baby. And in fact, that sign that I just mentioned isn't effective as a sign in a baby under six months in terms of meningitis. But it just shows this calling sacrum, cranial bones, incredibly linked via this dura and via these meninges. And so what I think happens with babies in extension, not just the one, you know, with astrophysics, but in lots of babies we see that, is that there's a contraction in the dura, a contraction in the meninges, and they are trying to go into this position of ease. They're trying to help those meninges by going into this extension pattern. So why would that 
Why would they be irritated? They don't have meningitis. Well, that can be because of birth trauma. It can be shock in the system. That could be drugs that we have to use during the birth process. It may be just the actual trauma to the system that causes the meningeal shock, uh, the pressure on the cranium, various different things. But in terms of, you know, let's look about how we're going to work with this. Well, yes, we need to release the shock through the cranium, and that's going to help hugely. You know, we need to detox the system, in, you know, in the, let that healing kind of pattern work through, whether that's support through the diet, nutrition, to make sure that they're not having formulas that aren't working for them or mum clears down nutrition in terms of what they're eating if they're breastfeeding. But more important than that, not more important, as important as that is to work on the sacrum and what you were saying, to work on the rib cage, work on all of those areas. So if you work on those areas, we're now creating slack in the system and allowing that dura to release a bit more and we get that extension pattern will often then drop out and drop away. And you will even influence strabismus, even if you worked on nothing else. But if you remember those cartoons of Tom and Jerry, where um, Tom and Jerry, uh, I can't remember, Tom's the cat? Yeah, Tom's the cat, or Jerry's the cat, whichever the cat, they get yeah. smashed. And then there's so much so that their eyes come out on stalks and they go, Dura, <laughs> and the meninges actually, as well as coming up around the spinal cord, around the brain, actually come and invest all the way to the back of the eyeball. So much so that the CSF reaches the back of the eyeball. So if you think of it like that, is that dura is connected to the back of the eyeball, then even if you work on that sacrum, you're working on those eyeballs. And you, if you have that in mind, it's like we talked about those coins. Suddenly, you know, a, a pound coin from the UK isn't a foreign coin to you if you're working in the States. It's like, wow, yes, I can work on the sacrum and make a direct influence on, on the eyes. Mm -hmm. Now, there was one more point I was going to make before I came out. So, okay, the tongue, sorry, the tongue. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a classic case of we never know everything. I am still searching for categorical reasons why babies stick their tongue out. Now, when you have this extension pattern, you would think they would bring their tongue back because of this contraction. But the opposite is true. You often see that baby stick that tongue out and that tongue out is definitely a sign of tension in the system. And I've seen it with those extension patterns. I'm not 100% sure why, but the key is you don't really want to work on the tongue there. Yes, we can work on the tongue from the mouth and the palate, yes. But if that ex it's that extension pattern, you get the extension pattern working well, you get the SBS working well, and you influence the tongue. Now there is influence on the tongue and the whole pharyngeal restrictor column through the neck and the mouth, I think that's mm -hmm. what's going on in terms of the tongue and the influence from the SBS and the sphenoid mm -hmm. in the tongue. But the key thing there is, you know, explore it and find out. And if you do, let me know. Mm -hmm. um, I will. Just work on that extension pattern, work on the cranium, and we'll see that tongue as a barometer of how well we're doing. All right. Yes. Great. Okay. Well, do you want to end here and we'll pick it up part two another time? Yeah. Definitely, and I think if people watching, whether they're watching now on the, or on the replay, if you've got questions, you know, fire those in because that really, you know, enables us to teach in the best way that we can, but it also gives us that clinical bent. You know, it's like, oh, I saw a baby doing this, and that's where we all get together, not just the two of you, know, you and me, Kate, but everyone, and we yeah. push our knowledge forward. And someone said, oh, I've seen that, and I've seen that, and this is how we move, we move forward, and we're not just technical, and we're not just dry anatomy, but we're really kind of a living embodiment uh, of what we do and what we can work with with babies. Yeah. Yes, great idea. I have already got some questions for you for next time. So I'm going to record, encapsulate this and put it up and we'll have see if we get some questions and some discussion. Brilliant. Thank you Thanks. so much. See ya. Good night. Good night. Good morning here, but good night to you. <laughs>